scripture tells us that all the victory belongs to Christ. Listen, I know it may not quite be time to start service. You might have a couple of minutes that you could just hang out right there in your seat, but I really feel like God is stirring and moving something. The reason for that is the last several months you may or may not have noticed that we've been bringing a lot of songs talking about victory. This song came to me uh, about a week ago, and I was thinking through that. I was thinking, what, what is God speaking? What is God trying to teach? What is God moving me towards? And then I started realizing these songs aren't for me. These songs are for us to sing together as we worship. And right now in this moment, we have victory. We're not fighting for victory. We are worshiping from a place of victory. So I want to do something that might be a little different this morning. I want to ask you to stand even though church hasn't started. And we are going to sing together about the victory that we have in Christ. Every victory is yours. Every victory is yours. You reign. Death is buried in the grave. Hell could not defy your name. You reign. Sing that again. Every victory. Every victory is yours. this morning well we are certainly excited we're glad you're here we're just gonna jump in and praise God for who he is Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our again let's lift our voices and tell him that he is so welcome to inhabit the praise of his people oh holy
victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For oh, the What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Oh, you turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Oh, praise he is so worthy how great is our God Jay hold on a second I want to go into confession and I want us to hear that refrain as we end the confession because isn't that what we are invited into we're invited to come and be who we are and stand before our Lord and he receives us and he is great in our lives so join with me as we recite our confession together most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in the power of Jesus Christ, he gives us the power to become the children of God and bestows on us the Holy Spirit. Amen. How great is our God. Sing with me.
seated. Our scripture today comes from Numbers 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and there's no water and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it up on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look upon the serpent of bronze and live. Our gospel today comes from the gospel of John, the third chapter. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. But the people became impatient on the way. That's not that. I'm going to read the right one. John 3. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believed in him who are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Grace to and peace this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Martin Luther was fond of saying that John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell. It's a verse that we memorize very early in our lives, right? And most of us, regardless of the translation that we read in our Bibles, We memorize it in the old King James. For God so loveth the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In so many ways, we witness to our faith by knowing this verse. And it's why I believe we teach our children from young on. And so as Jesus sits in this encounter... I wonder a little bit if we fully recognize what Jesus is doing in this moment. Because we witness to our faith as we recite it. But what if in this passage God is inviting us into something deeper than witnessing? What if God is inviting us into a relationship with him through the words of this text? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to challenge you to ponder what it means to witness to your faith and what it means to be in relationship with the living God through your faith. Let's take a look at this text from John 3. Sometimes I think we forget that this text is Jesus and Nicodemus sitting together at the table. Now we know the character, right? Nicodemus is a Pharisaic leader in the community. He's quite wealthy. He has a position of authority. He sits with great honor to the other Jews. And we know that Nicodemus comes in the dark of night to Jesus. Now there is a detail here that Jesus, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the dark of night that should not be lost in translation. See, Jews believed in the power of light and the power of darkness. It was in the darkness that Satan was most at work. It's why when God led his people from the wilderness, they had a pillar of cloud by day and they had a pillar of fire by night so that the darkness would not consume his people. 
Nicodemus knows both metaphorically and theologically what it means to come to Jesus in the cover of night. In the cover of darkness, Nicodemus can be whomever he desires. Isn't that true for us? In the cover of darkness, can't we choose to be whomever we desire? In the cover of darkness, aren't we protected from those seeing the heart of who we really are, the sin that we carry? But Jesus, Jesus, the light of the world, a light that is born into a world where the darkness cannot contain it. Jesus illuminates the darkness. He illuminates the darkness of this world. He illuminates the darkness of our life. And so I imagine as Nicodemus comes before Jesus, expecting to be protected and covered by the darkness, sitting before him is a light that cannot be contained. And in the midst of this interaction, Jesus says this, Just as Moses lifted the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted. Now, I love this, right? Nicodemus is a scholar. He's a Jew. He knows this. And this story in particular is incredibly important in the narrative of the life of the Jews. This is toward the end of their wandering in the wilderness. God promised generations ago that he would deliver his people and he would give to them a land of his choosing. He brought about plagues, and he delivered them from Pharaoh. And the the Israelites saw these amazing supernatural events happen before them. The sea parted, and they walked through. But in the midst of God delivering them, they lost their way. My friend likes to say, God put them in a timeout. Forty years of timeout. So they wandered in the wilderness, and they're nearing the end. Aaron has died. Moses is left to deliver the people to the land God had promised them. And in the midst of everything, in the midst of how God had cared for his people so intently, how God had provided everything they need, they grumbled against the Lord. It was like two million teenagers who said, we have nothing to eat, even though you've just been to the grocery store. Even though there's a refrigerator full of food, we have nothing to eat, we have nothing to drink. I want to go back to Egypt. The people cried out against God because life was not the way they wanted it to be. They allowed their disappointment to consume them. And they no longer saw the joy of God providing all that they needed before them. The people cried out, and God removed a protection. We read that serpents came from the ground. Now, there's a cool translation here that if we had another hour, we could really have some fun with this text. The first service didn't want to stay, so I'm guessing you don't either. But these serpents, they came from the ground, and they bit the people, and the people became sick, and they started to die. The serpents came, they bit the people, they became sick, and they started to die. And so they called out, Moses, pray for us. Moses, pray for us, help us. I so often read and lose count of how many times the Israelites grumble before God when they have everything so good. And I think, why don't they get it? And then I look in the mirror, and I think, why don't I? We've got it so good. Why, why don't I get it? You ever do that? It would seem God's mercy is as swift as his judgment. God calls to Moses, take a bronze image of the serpent. Place it on a pole so that everyone who would gaze upon it would be healed and restored to life. Think about that. God took the very thing that was causing sickness and death and put it on a pole so that all who would gaze upon it would be healed and restored to life. God took the very image of their suffering and put it on a pole so that all who would look to it would be healed and restored to life. 
It's amazing, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, I'm going to break your heart a little bit because you all memorize this verse. And I know you've had it memorized since you were very young. It's a bad translation, actually. It should read this way. It should read, God loved the world so much in this way that he gave his son. God loved the world so much. His love was so confusing that in this way he gave his only son. That he would be lifted up. There's a Greek word here called hypseo. Hypseo is not only to be vertically lifted up, but to be glorified. God loved the world in such a way that he glorified his only son for the sake of the world. The Gospel of John loves this world. A word, it's the only time you will find it. It occurs four times, and in each time it is referring to the glorification of the Son of Man. God loved the world so much and in this way that he glorified his own Son for our sake, that all who would gaze upon him would not perish, but would be restored to life. Jesus continues, because Love is so profound. God's love is so extraordinary. And if you have John 3, 16 memorized, I hope you have John 3, 17 as well. It says God did not call his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world would be saved through him. Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so God's son will be lifted up. Isn't that amazing? He's sitting with this Jewish scholar, and he's connecting all of the dots for him. Now we hear this voice. We stand here dying from our sin. We stand here dying and suffering from the pain that our sin causes. And the same word that Jesus had for Nicodemus, he has for us. God has lifted up his son so that as we gaze on the cross, we would be restored to life. In Christ, we are healed and restored. Now, sometimes we forget that because we have our minor pains and our temporal suffering. But God promises that as we gaze upon that which has been lifted up, his own son, who came in the same symbol of what is our problem, sin. He came as flesh to represent the flesh that is so broken about us. As it is lifted up, as he is lifted up, we gaze upon him and are restored to a new life. I think about Nicodemus. I think about this interaction that he was having with Jesus. Nicodemus likely could have recited the entire Torah by memory. Nicodemus would have known the stories of the Israelites through the wilderness wilderness, as if it was his story. He could have witnessed to God's truth day in and day out. Yet here he sat. He sits with the Word made flesh who is opening up the Scriptures in a new way. He's sitting with this Word made flesh inviting him not only to witness to his faith but into a relationship with the living God to connect all of the stories, to include Nicodemus into God's story. Like the people of old, God would not let Nicodemus hide in the shadows of the night. God would not let Nicodemus in the discontentment that he found himself in as he navigated faith through frustration. Now the light of Christ sat before him. And God's truth would be at work within him. You know, after this passage, we hear very little of Nicodemus until the end, right? It is Nicodemus who comes with Joseph of Arimathea to retrieve the body of Christ from the pole. 
That's the power of God's truth in our life. The power of God's truth in our life leads us to change how we live, to see a new life in him. I think about this text as we gather here today. When you look to the cross of Christ, do you see the glory of God being revealed, not just for the sake of salvation, but also for the sake of healing and restoration of your life? Do you see the very love of God on that pole? The flesh and blood of Jesus lifted up so that as we turn our gaze to one who looks a lot like us, God heals us. As we turn to this word made flesh, God restores us. God brings us to new life. I've been thinking about this text this whole week. You know, it was a year ago that we shifted from in-person worship to online It was a year ago that we paused life. It's been a year of distancing and isolation. It's been a year of restrictions. It's been a year of grumbling. Has it not? I talked to some of you. I'm grumbling, right? It's been a year of grumbling. In some ways, it feels like it's been a year of death. So I wonder, as we hear this text in reflection to this year, I wonder, do we see that God has already set what gives us life on a pole for us to focus our gaze upon? Do we see that in the midst of our frustration, in the midst of what we call suffering, that God has already provided everything that we need? and has set his own son on a pole to restore us and bring us to new life? Do we see that as we witness to our faith in word, that God is also inviting us into a relationship of deed that is centered and that life-giving image set on a pole for us? Because we can all sit and say over and over again, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have an eternal life. We can say it, but are we living it? We can say it all day long, but are we living into it? Are we living it in a way that is life-giving, that is life-changing, that is life-transforming as God intended it to be? Amen. As we hear God's word, let us come together in prayer for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we too cry out against you. Like the people of old, we grow weary and impatient. We lose our faith in you, the author and giver of life. And yet you loved the world in such a way that you gave us your own son, Christ, who would come in flesh and blood and be lifted up so that as we turn our gaze toward him, we would be healed and given life restore us to you, that we not only witness to your glory, but also engage in the relationship you most desire to have with us. Lord, in your mercy. God of grace and glory, we pray for all who are in need of healing in their mind, body, or spirit. Today especially, we name before you Carolyn Tiki's niece, Stacy, Sharon Smith's grandson, Henry, For Linda Rogers' daughter, Alyssa. For William Paul, Mike Halley. For Fred Barnes, Adam Wittrick. Tom and Frances Oline's granddaughter, Lizzie. For John and Linda Ritter's daughter, Alex. For Nancy Arneson, Barb Sandberg. Phil and Sally Nygaard's son-in-law, Emmanuel. For Sandy Axon's sister, Jackie. For Lori Andreas, Trina Arneson, Jim Moen. 
for Sharon Geyer's daughter, Wendy, for Carl Hedin and Dennis Pofel. We pray for all who are affected by COVID, for the sick and those who care for them, for vaccination locations and the process of communicating information. And Lord, finally, we pray for those who find themselves knowing the depth of grief, for Nancy Miller at the passing of her brother, Bob, for Cheryl Lyons at the passing of her father, Jean, for Denise Lawson at the passing of her father, Bob. Comfort and console all who mourn, Lord, in your mercy. God of the world, help us to love one another as you love us. Heal the divisions that exist and unite us in one care for your creation. Care for our neighbors, care for the communities you have entrusted to us. Lord, we ask that you would bless our schools, teachers, and staff, all who are working together to move forward beyond the effects of COVID, especially those effects and what they have had on our children. We pray for those who serve our community to keep it safe, our police, fire, and EMS. We pray for all who continue to work in our health care systems and dependent living facilities. Lord, we pray that you would empower us as a people and as a church to do your work, the work you have called us to do to bring glory to you. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. broken within overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the old Stand. We hear that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we join together praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Oh, come to his altar. blood of Christ shed for you. Come to the altar
May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. His love never fails. That's the one thing that we want to remember as we leave here this morning and go about our week. We serve a God. His spirit dwells within us. And his love, it never fails. Nothing can separate. Even if I run away, your love never fails. I'm probably going to make some mistakes, Lord. I know I still make mistakes. Sing for me every day, oh, love never fails, oh, because he stays the same, he stays the same through the ages, your love never changes, there may be pain in the night, joy comes in the morning, and when the oceans rain, Let's sing it out. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night. The joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. together for my good you make you make all things work together for my good think about that as we sing it all things you make all things work together for my good no one else can claim their God does all things work together for my good you stay the same you stay the same In the never failing love of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Notice the announcement page. There's lots of stuff going on. Easter lilies, you can start ordering those in honor and memory of folks. New member class. The announcement page is also always posted on our website, so if you don't catch something on Sunday morning, it's always there for you to review. Lots of stuff happening here at Our Saviors. Go in peace and serve the Lord. You stay the same to